you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first international symposium on critical analytical thinking. Or, this symposium is organized by Sakara University Academic Platform and Critical Analytical Thinking Platform. During the symposium, 57 papers will be presented. Today, we have two honorable keynote speakers with us. Our first keynote speaker is Professor Tariq Ramazan, president of the Think Tank Institution of European Muslim Network in Brussels. He is also a member of Oxford and Doshiha Universities. The, our second honorable keynote speaker is Professor Mohamed Mimtazeli from International Islamic University of Malaysia. Now may I ask Dr. Hakan Aslan on stage to give his opening speech on behalf of Academic Platform. He is also an academic member of Sakai University. Professor Muzaffer Amas, the rector of Sakarya University and the uh, honorary chair of the symposium, and Professor Arif Bilgin, the chair of the symposium, and the associate professor uh, Naji Chalar, the co-chair of the symposium, deans of the faculties, the honorable keynote speakers, guests, ladies, and gentlemen. At the outset, I must state that I am quite happy to be here today at this scientific organization. And I would like to extend my very warm welcome to all participants, especially to our foreign delegates and speakers. And thank you very much for participating in this symposium and sharing your research findings with us. The essence of the symposium lies in the contribution of the understanding of critical and analytical thinking and the establishment of its systematic structure along with sharing obtained scientific results with the scientific communities and all interested bodies. As you may know, the symposium is organized by Academic Platform, Critical and Analytical Thinking Platform, and Sakarya University. If you could possibly let me, I would like to give you brief information about Academic Platform, one of the partners of this symposium. And that the platform has an open environment for all the academicians all over the world to discuss and share the ideas in the field of engineering and social sciences. Some technical reports will also be prepared and presented regarding global engineering and social issues. In this was, we believe that the coordination between the academicians, scientists, and different sections of the society will be increased in the sense that awareness working together and producing universal knowledge. The platform is also involved in publishing international electronic journals. One of them is in the field of engineering and called Academic Platform Journal of Engineering and Science. The other one is related to social sciences and titled as Business and Management Studies, an international journal. I'm quite happy to say that there are multi-language services for the academicians all over the world to be familiar with the journals and their contents. You may find more information about the platform in the USBs available in the symposium bags that you will have. Dear guests, being analytical is about breaking situations Practices, problems, statements, ideas, theories, uh, arguments down into their component parts. And being critical is about not accepting things at the face value, but evaluating them. Through evaluation process, it is essential to make reasoned judgments about how valid, how effective, how important, how relevant, how useful, and how worthwhile they are. Critical and analytical thinking in this sense involves being aware of personal bias and prejudice in yourself and others, being open to new ideas, 
being prepared to consider all possibilities and viewpoints, being willing to reassess your own views. In order to demonstrate the analytical and critical thinking at the higher levels, you need to ask lots of questions. Some questions are fairly superficial, helping to identify the component parts of the situation or theory. Others probe beneath the surface, looking for reasons, explanations, and motives. We need to be very cautious about handling CAT, critical analytic thinking. It is not all about being very careful, alert, and open-minded about what you are in given by others. It is actually about designing the things that you should offer for others in a way that even most clever and critical brains can accept the offered ideas, techniques, and the thoughts. What I am basically trying to say is that we shouldn't passively use CAT, critical analytical thinking. On the contrary, we must be active when dealing with CAT. It, shouldn't be, it should be an effective instrument to produce the results that we try to suggest to the people so that they cannot reject them, even they critically evaluate the offered things. I'm quite sure that this process will make those people to accept the ideas or thoughts more easily and more effectively. I hope that you will enjoy your stay in Sakarya and get the full benefits of the symposium. The symposium dinner will be on today at 7 p.m. Uh, one of the most wonderful locations of the city and restaurant has been selected for your utmost satisfaction. I'm sure that it will be a great experience for all of you to have the chance of testing delicious Turkish food. There will be services available for uh, those who need transportation. Every care has been paid to make sure that there wouldn't be an accessibility problem. I must also mention the name of Mr. Abdul Qadir Altansoy as the representative of the, uh, of the organizing committee behind the scene. Their effort as a team for the organization of this symposium is well beyond all words. Thanks again for your participation. It was an honor for us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Dr. Aslan, for your speech. Now, I would like to invite Mr. Tanar Utmaz on stage to give his opening speech on behalf of Critical Analytical Thinking Platform. Saygıdeğer misafirler, kıymetli İlim Erbabı, değerli hocalarım, hepiniz hoş geldiniz. E, Kritik ve Analitik Düşünme Platformu, akademik platform ve Sakarya Üniversitesi'nin birlikte düzenlemiş olduğu, birlikte organize etmiş olduğu bu programda e, bu cuma sabahında e, hepimiz bir arada bulunuyoruz. Bugün burada Kritik ve Analitik Düşünmeyi konuşmak üzere buradayız. E, kritik ve Analitik Düşünmenin anlaşılması, yaygınlaştırılması, sistematiğinin oluşturulması, buna katkı yapmak, bu sempozyumdan çıkacak bilimsel veriler ışığında bu sonuçları bilim çevreleri ile paylaşmak için bu sempozyumu düzenlemiş bulunuyoruz. E, bu sempozyumu yapmaktan e, amacımızın bir tanesi de bu konuda çalışmış bulunan veya çalışan diğer Türkiye içerisindeki STK'larla, akademik camiayla bilgi ve tecrübe paylaşımı yapmak. Bir başka amacımız ise Türkiye'de bu konuda bir farkındalık oluşturmak istiyoruz. Özellikle sosyal çevrelerde ama daha özelde üniversitelerde, akademik camiada bir farkındalık oluşturmak istiyoruz. Bu konuyu önemsiyoruz biz. Türkiye'de de önemsenmesini, akademik camiada önemsenmesini arzu ediyoruz. Çünkü bu yurt dışında birçok üniversitede özellikle ders olarak okutuluyor ama Türkiye için bu konu bizim gündemimize 2001'de girdi. Biz de kritik ve analitik düşünme platformu olarak 2001'den beri bu çerçevede bazı çalışmalar yapıyoruz. 
2001'de e, buradaki salonda bulunan arkadaşlarımızın bir kısmı bilir belki. Kuşadası'nda yapılan bir otel programı olmuştu. Orada bize analitik ve kritik düşünme öğreten kitaplar alın, anlayarak okuyun, günlük hayatınızda tatbik edin diye bir tavsiye de bulunulmuştu. Biz de bu çerçevede bu çalışmalarımıza başladık. E, yaklaşık 2001-2015-13-14 e, e, senedir bu konular üzerine çalışma yürütüyoruz. Belli bir noktaya geldik. E, yurt dışında ders olarak okutuluyor dedik. Bizde üniversitelerimizde yeni seçimlik ders olarak yaklaşık e, 15 üniversitede konulmuş durumda. Ama e, daha alacağımız çok yol var diye düşünüyorum. Burada e, tabii önemli görevde e, üniversitelerimize akademik camiaya düşüyor. Bu konularda e, bu sempozyumun bir başlangıç olacağını düşünüyoruz. Bunun arkasının da geleceğini e, ümit ediyoruz. E, bu çalışma sürecinde çünkü güzel bir işbirliği yaptık sempo, e, akademik platformla ve üniversitemizde. İnşallah arkası gelecektir diye düşünüyoruz. Evet, e, analitik ve kritik düşünme diyoruz. E, Analiz edeceğiz ama e, neyi analiz edeceğiz? Kişisel ve sosyal olayları, iktisadi, sosyal, siyasi olayları analiz edeceğiz. E, problemleri analiz edeceğiz. Kritik düşünme diyoruz. Peki neyi düşüneceğiz? Neyi kritik edeceğiz? Neyi sorgulayacağız? E, hangi konulara eleştirel yaklaşacağız? E, tabii toplumsal boyutta iktisadi, siyasi, sosyal olayları, sorunları sorgulayacağız. Eleştirel yaklaşacağız ve çözüm üreteceğiz. Dünya gidişatını yönlendirmeye çalışan sistem ve organizasyonları daha iyi tanıyıp politikalarını ve politikalarını ve neticelerini sorgulayacağız, kritik edeceğiz. Kişisel boyutta ise hayatı, hayatın anlamını, ailevi ilişkilerimizi, şahsi problemlerimizi sorgulayacağız. Doğru soruları soracağız. Doğru cevaplara ulaşmak için önce tabii soruların doğru olması gerekiyor. Doğru soruları doğru şekilde, doğru zamanda soracağız. İyi, doğru, güzel ve faydalı olan çözümler üreteceğiz. Gerek sosyal, gerek siyasi, gerek iktisadi problemlerimize, gerekse kişisel, ailevi problemlerimize veya hayata, hayatın anlamına ilişkin olarak. Bugün içinde bulunduğumuz teknolojik gelişmeleri düşündüğümüzde özellikle internet ortamında bilgi erişmek daha kolay. Ama bugün bir başka şey söz konusu e, bilginin doğruluğu, sahihliği, e, manipülatif bilgi mi, e, yönlendirme amaçlı bilgi mi bunlar e, daha önemli. Neden? Çünkü bilgi erişmek kolaylaştı artık. Bugün tabi bilgi sahibi olmaktan ziyade Bilgelik ön planda olması gerekir. Bu mevcut bilgileri sorgulayabilmemiz, eleştirebilmemiz, bu bilgilere eleştirel yaklaşabilmemiz daha önemli diye düşünüyorum. Peki biz platform olarak neler yapıyoruz? E, platform olarak öncelikle e, interaktif bir çalışma ortamı düşündük. E, bunun için bir web sayfası dizayn ettik ve mümkünse bütün çalışmalarımızı internet üzerinden kurgulamaya çalıştık. Ne kadar büyük toplantılar yapsak bile herhalde bu salonları doldurabiliriz ancak. Ama internet ortamında insanlara ulaşmayı denersek daha geniş kitleye ulaşabiliriz dedik. Ve bu sebeple bütün çalışmalarımızı internet üzerinden kurgulamaya çalıştık. Bunun dışında bu toplantı ve benzer olan sempozyum ve çalıştaylar organize ettik. Ayrıca özellikle ilk orta liste seviyesinde milli eğitimle e, üniversite seviyesinde işte gökle işbirliği arayışları içerisindeyiz. Bir eğitim müfredatı geliştirebilirsek e, tabi bunun biraz bize özgü olabilmesi lazım. Bunu geliştirebilirsek de üniversitelerimizde ve e, ilk orta liste seviyesinde e, öğrencilerimize bir e, ders teklifimiz olacak. İnşallah o konuda da e, özellikle hocalarımızın akademik camianın desteklerini bekliyoruz. Ee, sözlerimi bitirirken e, burada e, katılımlardan dolayı herkese özellikle e, sempozyumun hazırlanma sürecinde emeği geçen kritik analitik düşünme platformumuzun sekreteri Doktor Saadettin Düryen Bey'e, akademik platform sekreteri Abdülkadir Aksoy Bey'e, e, Altınsoy Bey'e isimlerini şimdi hatırlamadım ama e, bütün emeği geçen arkadaşlarımıza ayrı ayrı teşekkür ediyorum. Misafirperverliğinden, ev sahipliğinden dolayı 
Sakarya Üniversitesi rektörümüze teşekkür ediyorum. Ee, i̇nşallah bu sempozyum kritik ve analitik düşünmenin e, hayat tarzı haline getirerek sağlıklı düşünme metodu geliştirip bu doğrultuda kararlar alabilen her türlü iç ve dış etkilere rağmen evrensel değerler ışığında bilinçli ve nitelikli bir hayat sürme çabasında olan bir toplumun inşasına da katkıda bulunacaktır diye düşünüyorum. Hepinize tekrar ayrı ayrı teşekkür ediyorum. Thank you very much, Mr. Ukmez, for your speech. Now, may I kindly invite Professor Muzaffer Elmas, Director of Sakarya University, on stage to, to deliver his greeting speech. Evet, sempozyumumuza katılan e, çok değerli misafirler, e, yurt dışından ve yurt içinden gelen değerli katılımcılar, çok değerli e, öğrenciler, hepinizi saygıyla selamlıyorum. Bu sempozyumun üniversitede yapılmasından duyduğum e, mutluluğu gerçekten konuşmalar yapılırken bir kere daha e, yani içimden gelen bir duygu oldu. Bunu da sizinle paylaşmak istiyorum. E, çünkü bu sempozyumun bizim açımızdan iki çok önemli nedeni var. Bir tanesi biz e, yüksek öğretimde e, gelişme ve dönüşüm yapan, ee, bu konuda hızlı adımlar atan bir üniversiteyiz. Aslında yaptığımız dönüşümün, e, bunu hep biz paylaşıyoruz akademisyenler, tam merkezinde, üniversitemizin temel olarak bu atılımların merkezinde, kişilere kendi alanları dışında öğrencilerimize yetkinlik kazandırma var. Bunu merkeze koyduk. Bu yetkinlik kazandırmayı her şeyin desteklemesini planlıyoruz. Yani yaptığımız planın özü de bu. Yani akademisyenler, üniversitemizin altyapısı, üniversitemizdeki faaliyetler, üniversitemizdeki ders planları, üniversitemizdeki her şeyin bu öğrencilerimize kendi meslekleri dışında yetkinlik kazandırma eksenine oturuyor. Bu dünyada da böyle. Dünyanın neresine giderseniz gidin bu konuda çok yoğun çalışmalar var yani günümüzde. Bu yetkinlikler arasında tabii zamanla işte bilişim yetkinliği, i̇şte, e, onun dışında e, mesela bir yabancı dil yetkinliği e, ve bazı başka iletişim becerileri yetkinliği, bir yeri yönetme yetkinliği ve son zamanlarda çok yukarılara çıkmaya başlayan, daha çok önemsenen kritik ve analitik düşünme yetkinliği geliyor. Dolayısıyla biz her öğrencimize bu yetkinliği kazandırmak zorundayız ki Mezun olduğunda günümüz dünyasında değişime, dönüşüme, bilgi çağının getirdiği farklılaşmaya, getirdiği bombardımana, bilgi bombardımanına, algı yönetimine, dünyada bunlar artık e, bunlar olmaya başladı. Az önce konuşmalarcılar da söyledi. O yüzden öğrencilerin çok çok ihtiyacı olduğu bir yetkinlik bu. Bu tabii iki yönle kazandırılır. Bir tanesi... Derslerde bu tür dersler açarak bizde böyle bir seçimlik dersimiz var. Asıl önemlisi de tüm derslerde bu yetkinliği kazandıracak ders anlatma yöntemlerini değiştirmekte. De. Zaten bununla da biz şu andaki önemli çabalarımızdan da biri o. Dersleri bilgi aktarmaktan çıkardık, bunları yasakladık. Dersleri daha çok tartışma, eleştirme, yorumlama bir şeyi raporlama, bir şeyi karar verme gibi yetkinliği geliştirmeye yönlendirme çabamız var. O bakımdan bu sempozyumun toplantının sonuçlarından da bizim bu çabalarımıza katkı verecek önemli çıktılar olacağına inanıyorum. Dolayısıyla arkadaşlarımızın bu konuda gayretlerini biz her zaman uygulamaya hazırız. Tabii bu eğitim öğretimi olan katkısı. İkincisi de biz Sakarya Üniversitesi olarak ikinci çok önemli misyonumuz var değerlerine bağlı nesiller yetiştirme konusunda üniversitemizin misyonu. Bunu her tarafta açıkça ifade ediyoruz. Bu konuda da e, yapılan bu çalışmalar e, sürekli yaptığımız bu salonlarda bizi en çok mutlu eden çalışmalar da toplantılar da bu misyonumuza katkı veren çalışmalar. Dolayısıyla bu mantaliteyi biz kendi değerlerimiz üzerine oturtabilecek bir model üretebilirsek Buradan tüm Türkiye'ye bu konuda örnek olabiliriz. Çünkü bu konuları çalışan bir üniversiteyiz biz. Yani bizim yaptığımız her şey bunu desteklediği için bu konuda en iyi sonucu da biz alabiliriz. 
O yüzden bugünkü ve bu yapılacak olan bu toplantıyı bu bakımdan da çok çok önemsiyorum. Böyle bir kritik analitik düşünme adı altında bir misyonu e, temsil eden bir grup tarafından aslında e, bizim de içinde e, uzun yıllarda bulunduğumuz bir grup tarafından olması da çok çok sevindirici bir şey. Çünkü bu e, hani biz e, kendimiz en çok bu tür düşünmelere, bu tür basit yönlendirmelere ihtiyaç olan bir inancın da e, inancın da e, mensuplarıyız aslında. Ben burada bir örnekle bu konuyu tamamlamak da isterim. Hani biz öğrencilik yıllarında da yine e, bu konularda her konuda çok çok bilgiler olurdu. Özellikle bu e, inanç dünyamız e, bakımından da biz en çok e, böyle bizim mensup olduğumuz arada çok sık gittiğimiz işte İskender Paşa'ya gittiğimizde Hoca Efendi'nin sohbetlerinde böyle basit, pratik, insanı rahatlatıcı, yol gösterici mesajlar bize en çok tatmin eden mesajlar olmuştur. Yani bu 74-80 arasının karmaşık, kompleks atmosferinde herkesin bir tarafa çektiği yerde basit, pratik. Gerçekten bu bizim ge geleneğimizin aslında bir uzantısı. O bakımdan bu platformu da tebrik ediyorum. Yani çok önemli bir işin içindeler. Biz bu sürecin hani sempozyumun birincisi burada olmuş, ikinci, üçüncü, onuncunun inşallah Sakarya Üniversitesi'nde olsun. Bu geleneksel bir bizim bir aktivitemiz olsun. Bundan çok memnun oluruz. Ben tekrar katılanlara hoş geldiniz diyorum. Organize edenlere de teşekkür ediyorum. Sevgiler, saygılar sunuyorum. Thank you very much, Mr. Rector, for your speech. Now, I would like to invite our first honorable keynote speaker, Professor Tariq Ramazan. He is a professor of contemporary Islamic studies at Oxford University. He is teaching in two faculties of Oriental Studies and Theology and Religion. He is also president of the Think Tank Institution of European Muslim Network in Brussels. His speech will be about the importance of critical thinking for Muslim societies, both in the West and the East. Can I close this? أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Thank you for your invitation here, Rector, and all the organizations of this critical analytical thinking and asking us to think about the importance of critical thinking in our uh, societies, be it in Muslim majority countries or in the West. And I think it's a, a good question. And uh, once again, I think that when we speak about uh, critical thinking, uh, it's not only to speak about critical thinking in human sciences. Uh, critical thinking means that we start with our own selves. It's with our own way of looking at the world, there is no critical thinking in sciences if there is no critical thinking in our own perceptions, understandings, and, and way of dealing with, uh, uh, with issues. So let me start with a short introduction uh, about the way from within the Islamic tradition and from within our understanding of our sciences and our way of dealing with uh, uh, uh, our knowledge and also the world around us, we have to deal with this. Uh, as I want to do this is very much to, to deal with our own uh, tradition, our own frame of reference as Muslims, 
and, and then also to uh, broaden the, the picture, to widen the perspective and to see how we do we have to deal with other sciences and other uh, dimensions as, uh, as Muslims, but also as thinkers, as uh, uh, citizens, as human beings in the world today. Let me start by trying to give a, a sense of what I mean by critical thinking or analytical thinking when it comes to, to us. Uh, first, from within the Islamic tradition, there is something which uh, it's also to be questioned. Are we here dealing with pure rationalism? Meaning that at the end, everything is questionable to the point that everything becomes relative. So, uh, the very essence of this deconstructivist approach, which is pure rationalism, is presented itself as not ideological. But in fact, there is an ideology when there is no ideology. So it starts with this. You say, what do you mean? Is this pure rationalism? And at the end, the only parameter for us to deal with is rationality and rational logic. Or is there something else that we are considering? So um, when I'm saying this, uh, for me, it's very important from within the tradition to be quite clear on what we think. If we are serious about Islam, there is something which is essential as a starting point. We are dealing with two dimensions. One is faith and the other is reason. And what we are saying from within our tradition, nothing is in contradiction between faith and rationality. But there are things that, as a starting point, we are saying we believe in them, not because they are rationally proven, even though many things could be rationally proven, but because we believe in them as a starting point. So when we uh, are talking about uh, uh, um, critical thinking here, it's something that we have to define. Are the limits or is the everything based on a rational uh, and analytical uh, take. Let me start with something which is important in the way we deal with critical thinking from within the Islamic framework to my understanding and the way I see it, which once again is the relationship with faith and reason. Once, in one situation, Hubab ibn Mundir uh, in Ghazwat Badr, came to the Prophet, peace be upon him. And he was quite clear in his question, which has to do with war strategy. He came to him and, and asked him, the place where we are now, is it coming from God or is it coming from you? Is this a revelation that if it's a revelation, I'm not going to discuss it? Or is it your own understanding of the strategy by coming to the closest wills and not to the biggest one where the enemy are coming? And he said, this is my opinion. So he told him, that's wrong. That's not a good strategy. From the very beginning, he had three things. First, asking, from God or from you? Is it divine or is it human? If it's divine, so I take it as it is. But if it's uh, for, uh, from you, whoever you are as the messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it means that it's questionable. What is human is questionable. One. Second, he came with something which is trying to understand. So first is the source. Second is the intellectual attitude. I want to understand what you are doing. Is this right logic? So understanding is a second condition. Third is questioning. Because there is no way to ask the people to understand if there is no space to question. So he was questioning the authority of the Prophet, not as the messenger, but as the leader of the community in times of war. First, the source. Second, the understanding. Third, questioning. This is where it's important, but you understand me quite clearly here, from an Islamic perspective, the sources are clear that if we say, I believe in God, there is something which is 
a frame through which you are looking at the world and it's not to start questioning for us from our perspective even you know god and then the truth of the quran and everything if this is the case you will end up having a deconstructive approach that you have to assume if you want to go as far as this this is your responsibility but i would say as a believer there is something which is coming from the divine and something coming from human beings everything which is human uh, in this it's uh, uh, uh, has to be discussed so for us in our understanding and let me tell you something which is very clear here is that everything which is human could be questioned and this is where in our own tradition with the Torah, the legacy that we had as Muslims we need to define what is coming from God and what is constructed by human beings why because we end up today idealizing sacralizing and taking for something which is undisputable things that were coming from human beings in our history the way they were dealing with the scriptural sources the way they were dealing with the context the way they were dealing with history they had an opinion they came with the vision so they were looking at the world the way we are looking at the world now so we should not idealize the past and sacralized human opinions all the great scholars in all the traditions, Sunni and Shia, said it quite clearly. If my opinion is right regarding the scriptural sources, take it. If it's wrong, you reject it. Meaning, I'm just but a human being. I am not more than a human being. So we, the critical thinking, it's first a critical take on human history and humanity saying everything which is human is open for discussion by questioning the source, understanding the meaning, and setting some questions and critical questions in our understanding. And this has to be done also with our um, uh, uh, human legacy and Islamic legacy, uh, taking as something positive questions and debates. And as it was said, if you want this within academia, you have to give the space for people to question and the freedom to question. And the freedom to question, the starting point when we are within the Muslim community, is not because I'm questioning that I have less faith than you, not questioning. The quality of your faith does not depend on the fact that you accept without questioning. In fact, deep questions could help us to have deep faith. There is no contradiction between questioning and believing. Quite the opposite, and you will see this in our tradition. Now, there is something that also it's important. The first Islamic science was fiqh, Islamic law and jurisprudence. And by the way, be careful with the way I'm translating the concepts, because I will come to this. We have to be very careful with terminology and definition, because some of the definitions are coming from human beings. Even definitions should be questioned. So what I'm saying here, Islamic law and jurisprudence. What was the attitude that was expected by people asking for legal opinion, for a fatwa? They go to the scholar, and this was with the companions, and you know that the companions didn't want to give fatwa. They were scared of going too far with the truth. But if you go to a scholar and you ask for a fatwa on a specific issue, if you are not equipped, you get the answer, but you have a duty. The duty is, give me the rational. How did you come to this opinion? If not, you are muqallid. Muqallid, you are imitating. You are taking from the scholar, and that's it. So you have the answer, but you don't have the understanding. That's not the way. If we don't have an authority or a clergy in Islam, it means that this relies on the community. And if the Prophet, peace be upon him, is saying, this community is not going to agree on something which is wrong, it means that this community, its specificity is critical thinking. Ask for the rational. Don't follow blindly what the scholar is saying. It's not because you like the scholar that his answer is right. The rational is the parameter. Meaning what? Question the scholar. Try to understand the, the, the, the way he is thinking to, get, uh, to give you an answer. Even in the field of fiqh, Islamic law and jurisprudence, we have to be rationally committed to understand what it's coming from. So we're asking to the source. The scholar is giving us a fatwa. This is haram. So why? 
Give me the source. Second, the rational. Third, I question. Exactly the same rational that we have with Hubab ibn al-Mundhir, which is exactly what we are talking about in, uh, in this. Now, we all uh, refer to one hadith coming from the Prophet, peace be upon him, uh, when he was sending uh, Mu'adh ibn Jabal to Yemen. Mu'adh ibn Jabal was sent to Yemen in the lifetime of the Prophet, a.s.w. And there is something which is very interesting here, which is he's asking him on why are you going to rely on Quran? And then if you don't find in the Quran, the Sunnah of the Prophet, والسلام, and then I'm going to exert myself, my mind to get an answer. I'm not going to restrict myself. Meaning, when the text is not clear, when your tradition is not directing, my mind is the reference. And to use my mind, I need first to understand the message, second, to know the context in Yemen, because you are going to see things that are not in the text, and third, you have to make up your mind and come with a decision. Your mind is the only link, the only way for you to be faithful to the tradition. Only if you understand. Only if you understand. So critical thinking is about this. In our tradition, there is no way to be a good Muslim following the Islamic teachings if your mind and your critical mind based on sources, question and understanding is not there. No way. So this is where we have to understand this, that this is a requirement. In fact, an imitating Muslim is a contradiction in terms. A Muslim who is imitating is a contradiction in terms if you don't understand what you are doing. And all the people are saying, you know, this is for average Muslims. Let the, the, the people follow. I think this is very dangerous. This underestimation of the people by some Muslim scholars is, and intellectuals is very problematic. Because... What is coming from Islam is not don't rely on the leaders, rely on the followers. They should understand what you are doing. Al jama'a, meaning al mujtama, it's so essential. So, uh, popular education is the starting point of everything, and popular education in critical thinking, not in imitating, not in say what I'm saying, follow your sheikh. So, uh, more than that, even, more than that, even. If you come to the scriptural sources and we say everything is in the Qur'an, is it true? No. All the principles are in the Qur'an, not all the implication and implementation. You don't have in the Qur'an anything about the contemporary medical sciences or human sciences. So the principles are there, but not the answer. And more importantly, what is said by the Prophet ﷺ in Allah, سَكَتَ عَنْ أَشْيَاءَ رَحْمَةً بِكُمْ بِغَيْرِ نِسْيَانَ That Allah kept quiet, silent on some issues, not out of forgetfulness, but out of mercy. Meaning what? His silence is the starting point of our critical thinking. And he, he was silent in so many things. Meaning what? Make up your mind. Think about it. Question. Try to find a way. So this is our tradition that silence is so important for us that it's in the Quran. Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu la tas'alu an asha. In Don't ask about things that if they were revealed to you, they will be negative for you. So my silence is a mercy. Don't ask too much. Don't ask too much while the Quran is revealed because you will have to answer when the Quran has been revealed, was revealed, and then there is a silence in history. So make up your mind. Look at this. This is a powerful message from within for us to come to this critical thinking. And this is where... Within Islam, and from within Islam, we have to uh, come to a, a, a kind of a framework from which we are talking about uh, critical thinking, which is a call, a necessity, an imperative of our way of being faithful to our uh, religion. Now, as I said, I'm not going in the name of critical thinking to come and to question everything for the sake of questioning everything, because I'm following an ideology that is not... Uh, saying its name, for example, by saying, you know, uh, I'm questioning God, I'm questioning the very essence of the Qur'an, that the Qur'an is not the very word of God. If you push that way, you have to have a clear uh, uh, starting point. 
that for me Allah is Allah there is one God and the Quran is the Quran and this is the very word of God if you go that way uh, and you have some of our you know we have some of our intellectuals they wanted to follow in the footsteps of the Western ideology saying there is no ideology and saying the Quran is as any other book that's that's problematic for me and I would say no I'm sorry I'm starting with there is one God, there is a book that was revealed, and now I have to use my critical thinking even uh, in the way I'm dealing with this. So when I, list, I, I read in the Quran, Sami'na wa ata'na, Sami'na wa ata'na, this is in Surah Al-Baqarah, Sami'na wa ata'na, it means something, we heard and we obey. But I rationally have to try to understand even where my reason stops. That sometimes the, the, the, the final answer is not only coming from reason that the Prophet, the, the Quran is saying, لَهُمْ قُلُوبٌ لَا يَفْقَهُونَ بِهَا They have hearts, they don't uh, uh, understand with their heart. So for me, the sources of knowledge are not only my mind, it's my heart. And I understand in a spiritual way what it means to say, أَلَا بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ تَطْمَئِنُّ الْقُلُوبِ That my heart is going to be at peace when I remember him. So I mean here that there is a knowledge, مَعْرِفَةُ اللَّهِ Which is not only rational, my heart is speaking. This is the starting point of my concept of human being. And it's through this that I'm operating a critical thinking. Not by destroying everything, but having a clear framework from which I start. So I would say this because the perception that I had from people who were talking about what you are trying to do is, oh, these are modernists that they are questioning the Islamic references, which is not exactly what you are doing. But you have to be clear on the framework and, and the starting point. And, and this is uh, uh, an object of discussion when it comes to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to this. So, the first is the framework, the condition, and I was saying faith and what is divine. And now in our understanding, a clear commitment to say, okay, let, me, let us try to say what is divine and what is human. And we start the critical thinking uh, by uh, trying to understand, uh, getting a clear sense of the sources, and to be intellectually committed in the whole process. It means that in everything which has to do with our references as Muslims, but not only, in human sciences, in social sciences, experimental sciences, we need to be very clear about, uh, first, when it comes to Islam, the knowledge of the texts. That's something which is important. What do the texts say? And the level, because not the texts are not of the same level. And even in the hadith, we have to be very cautious. The sahih and the da'if are not at the same level. And we also have to understand the priority. We don't put everything at the same level. We don't put everything at the same level. Praying is the most important thing. And sometimes in the Islamic, uh, uh, in the Islamic way of dealing with our issues today, we put secondary things at the highest level. It's as if now, if uh, depending the way you dress, or depending if you are the headscarf, this is the, the, the first factor to define who is a Muslim. That's not true. El Iman first, and then the way you dress, not the way you dress. It's not the way the people are seeing you, it's the way you are with God. So we have to put the right principles and the right priorities. So uh, uh, the, the, the knowledge of the text, knowledge of history, it's important. The knowledge of the context, you can't understand the Quran if you don't have a clear understanding of the context within which the Quran was revealed. So we need to have a sense of history. It's not a book that you read like this and there is nothing that you have to add. The connection between the text and the context of Revelation, what we have in Ulum al-Quran as Asbab in nuzul why this was, what were the uh, uh, conditions and the reasons of revelation are very important. So text, history, context, um, it's important. So the starting point for us from within is we are going to question everything which is human in our tradition. We are not scared of that. Be it the greatest scholar and even sometimes the, the understanding, the Prophet ﷺ was saying in some issues, the worldly affair, I'm a human being like you. So he was saying this on, uh, when it came to agriculture. So when it's coming from the prophet, we take it as it is because he's the messenger, peace be upon him. But any other opinions that are coming as human beings, we are questioning this in our tradition and 
in uh, our history. Now, from where shall we start? Because if you only deal with social sciences and you are at the periphery of knowledge, you might question social sciences and not question your own terminology when you deal with your own Islamic sciences. And I would say that this is not the right way to start. We need to start with ourselves, as I said. So what, what do we have, to, where do we have to start? Come to the discussion that we have among Muslim scholars and Muslim intellectuals and in all the human sciences. One of the most important problems that we have today is a question of definition and terminology. Okay, you want me to sit with you and just we can try for a while to do something. I'm not going to play that game right now, but think about it. You will see that's uh, uh, uh, uh, problematic. In fact, I'm not talking about from Arabic to Turkish or from Arabic to European language. From Arabic to Arabic, how do you define Sharia? Who is defining Sharia? If you have a faqih, I mean, from the legal framework, defining Sharia, he will have a specific understanding. This is Islamic law. If you go to al mutasawwifin the mystics, they are having another understanding. And if you go to Ersir Hindi, 16th 16, uh, 16, uh, 16 century, he was saying we have to reconcile the legal and the uh, mystical. If you go to philosopher, Sharia has another meaning. Makaram is Sharia, for example, in uh, Isfahani, it's something which is completely different from the narrow understanding of the legal. Don't we have, we today as Muslims, to ask ourselves, how are we going to define Sharia? Not only because the West is not understanding, you know why? Because we are not understanding what we are talking about. Sharia is not only the legal framework, it's deeper than that. So we have to define and ask ourselves, who is defining and from where? So, for example, this is a, a, an imp even, I, I'm saying Sharia. Now, when you speak about Islam, we had a discussion with uh, uh, Professor Tajas uh, when we were coming about, for example, the meaning of Islam. And some are saying Islam is a religion, others are saying Islam is civilization, or Islam is a concept of death and life. Okay, in European languages, Islam is submission. Now, come to me. Do you think in Arabic, now you try to get it in Arabic and in Turkish, that the right understanding of Islam is submission in the way it's perceived in other languages? Or what is the highest value that we have in Islam? Is it not Islam as a call to peace because Allahu was salam, yad'u ila salam wa ila dar as salam is the meaning of peace, so it's something which is wider than this, is how are you going to get peace with yourself, peace with the creation, peace with God, and going to peace, which is the final destination. If we translate Islam in the way we are doing it, Today, accepting some translations coming from Orientalists, we are not doing the job. We are not critical even in the way we present ourselves. We understand our way of life, our religion within a concept of death and life. That's deep. That's very deep. And to say, oh, it's not a religion, it's not enough. We have to go with the definitions here, which is important. What is your definition, for example, of jihad? What is the definition for, of Khilafah? And it's not because of what is happening in Syria or in uh, uh, Iraq today that we have to come back, oh, Khalifa doesn't mean this. There is a deep meaning of vicegerency in Islam. It has to do with our cosmology, our understanding of life and death. This is, these are things that we have to be critical with. If we don't come back to this, we are ending up to have some adaptation in different sciences, not understanding where sciences lie in our understanding of the world. So these are definition that we don't have. For example, another concept that uh, we need to be critical about this. We need, to, we, we need new answers or maybe redefining some of the concept in the light of some of the problems or issues that we are facing today. For example, Ishtihad. For the last 200 years, we have been talking about Ishtihad. Oh, Ishtihad is helping us to work in Muhammad Iqbal, saying this is the driving force. That's fine. But if you look at our Ishtihad today, are we coming with something which are new ideas, or only adapting to the world the way it is? That we have 
Islamic economy, Islamic finance, Islamic, Islamic, Islamic, everything is Islamic to adapt to the world and not transforming sciences. We are adapting ourselves. Ishtihad should be a way to change the world. We are using it as the way to adapt to the world. A problem. What do you mean by Ishtihad? I have been with my teachers in Egypt getting the Ijazat with people who were telling me about Ishtihad and then I understood that we don't have the same understanding. I understood Islam as a way of changing the world for the better and what I got in legal issues is just to adapt. Because when you are a lawyer, you know that very often laws are coming after the, the, the way the world is changing. It's very much about jurisprudence with law. So adapting. In Islam, it's not this. We should not do that. So the meaning of ishtihad is problematic here. In, and even maslaha. Maslaha. In English, you have scholars saying, maslaha is unrestricted public interest or individual interest. That's a problem. Because maslaha is not about this. Maslaha is not unrestricted. It's an ethical interest that we are looking. It's ethical. We need to have something which is right. It's not open and you, you, the silence of Allah in issues is not for us to do whatever we want. We have to be guided by the vision of what is good for humanity. So there is an ethical goal that we need to achieve. This is maslaha. Al masalih al mursala and restricted public interest and even interest here is problematic in the way we define this. But not only in the way we, define, we, we translate this, in the way it's understood by scholars themselves. Are we working on our terminology or not? Not enough. It's as if we accept some of the definitions that are coming. Now, there is another field where it's very important for us, and I, I, I, I'm telling you, critical thinking is not outward. It should start inward. It's our categorization of sciences. Categorization of sciences and hierarchy of sciences. If you look at the, the way we are dealing, if you come with, so there is the Quran and Sunnah. And from the Quran, we have Ulum al Quran, the Sunnah, Ulum al Sunnah, al Hadith. And then you have Usul al Fiqh, and then you have Fiqh, and then you have Ilm al Tasawwuf, Ilm al Kalam, Ilm al Akhlaq, Ilm al. All this Ulum that we have, this categorization is coming from where? Come with it. Is it in the Quran? It's not in the Quran. Is it in the Sunnah? It's not in the Sunnah. It's coming from where? It's coming as a human construction. And we can understand at the beginning we are talking about Islamic sciences. Why are we talking about Islamic sciences? Can I ask you a question? What is Islamic in Islamic sciences? Good question. I asked this question in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Pakistan, in fact, uh, when uh, I was dealing with uh, a university and the answer that I got was not clear. Is it Islamic because the object is Islamic, so the Quran, the Sunnah, and things? What is Islamic in Islamic sciences? And what is not Islamic in mathematics, in social sciences? Where, why do, you put, do we put Islamic? And then we say we need to have a comprehensive approach. And that's a problem. If you are categorizing Islamic sciences, and then what we have now, people saying, oh, it's not really Islamic sciences, it's sacred sciences. Because they deal with the sacred, the Quran was Sunnah. But this is a problem once again, because when you are dealing with fiqh, fiqh, it's all about human production. So my opinion is sacred? I have an, a sacred opinion? Or where stops the divine and starts the human? That's a big question here. So we have this categorization of science that we are not dealing with. But be careful. Because with categorization of sciences, there is a hierarchy of science. And the hierarchy of sciences today, the main science that we have in Islam is fiqh. Why? Because we are dealing with halal and haram. If you are looking for shuyukh, you will mainly have the sheikh is the one who is telling you halal and haram. But a philosophy of the legal framework. The whole understanding of the system is, should be the master science. We don't have this. It's the legal. And then with this hierarchy of science coming from our history, at the beginning, the scholars, they started with the legal, but we, they were open to everything. This is why we didn't have a problem with science. We didn't have a problem with arts. We didn't have a problem with all the sciences because one was 
helping us to get the framework, but we are open to all the sciences. Al Hikmatu Dallatul Muslim. Wisdom is the lost property of the Muslims, and we take it from wherever we find it. But today, because we are on uh, the defensive, halal and haram became the main science. And we are not critical. It's just give us a fatwa on this or that. That's a problem because it's turning uh, upside down the priorities of our knowledge and our understanding. So uh, be careful as well because this categorization of science is structuring power. Who has the power to decide? And by the way, today, look at the Islamic world. Who speaks for the Muslim? Who has the authority? From which science do you have the authority to speak about this? If you want a fatwa in medical sciences, who is going to give you the fatwa? Very often, a sheikh. But what does he know about science? What does he know about the field? How is this structure? And we, as Muslims, we don't have a clergy, but we have lots of authorities playing without naming them from within. There is an informal authority that it's there, that the sheikh or the ulama, but who, whom, how? We don't talk about this enough. It's completely scattered with not clear. And we don't like to speak about power, yet we have to speak about power. It's critical. You want critical thinking? Question power. Not only the dictators, but within. The religious authority, the way it works within. How? Who is saying this? How is he able to say this, uh, for example? So this is also an important process. And uh, when you talk in the West, when you live in the West, I'm a Western Muslim, if you know that. I, I was born and raised in, in, in Europe, and my world is in the West. I'm dealing with something which is very important in the West today, and the critical thinking has to deal with it, with the sense of complexity, the new complexity of the world, is fragmentation of knowledge. In fact, we have people very much specialized in different fields, but there is no connection between knowledge. So specialization at the highest level and a scattered knowledge, no final goals, no ethical goals that we are setting. Fragmentation of knowledge makes you very efficient in details scattered as the overall picture. We have exactly the same problem as Muslims. We are talking about a comprehensive way, but the way we deal with our sciences is completely scattered. Today, it's as if when you speak about philosophy, it's wrong. When you speak about mystics, you are almost outside. When you speak about uh, uh, the other sciences, when you speak about sociology, or, or they are lower sciences. It's not really sacred. It's just something that we deal with because we have to. And I think this hierarchy is also problematic. So for us, from within, we need to discuss the Torah. We need to discuss the legacy. Many opinions, are, uh, we know the majority opinions, but we also have to deal with some of the scholars. You know, we had in our history very courageous ulama. And they came with very specific questions and answers to some of the things. You know, for example, in Hukm al-Ridda, that you have to kill somebody who is changing his religion. In 8th century, uh, uh, you had scholars... Uh, uh, uh, coming and saying, no, it might be wrong that the Prophet, peace be upon him, never did it. He never killed somebody because he or she changed his or her religion. So he came with an opinion that was an opinion that he's maybe the only one. He's against the majority. But who told you that truth is with the majority? It might be that somebody came with one opinion, very well rooted in the tradition, with the, his reading of the scriptural sources. He might be right and the others may be wrong. And then we have now people coming and rediscovering him, uh, Sufyan al Thawri, and saying he might be right because what he said is right. So the majority opinion of a time is also a majority opinion that is coming out of culture, out of political circumstances, out of priorities. But the majority, we know today, you say, look at what is happening in the world. Do you trust majorities about truth? You just trust majority about choosing a leader. And you know that sometimes he's not the best or she's not the best. It's just a majority process. So majority has nothing to do with truth. 
even in science. One could be right against all the others. And he was, he is going to be sidelined in history. We have to rediscover that. This is critical thinking. Let me check the opinions, not follow the majority. This is the opposite uh, attitude of being muqallad. So muqallad is following this. So we need also to talk, to do this and to also put people in history. One of my great scholars and my reference is Abu Hamid al Ghazali. Abu Hamid al Ghazali was great. He was the one who was trying to connect. But he was a, a, a thinker of his time. What he's saying about the relationship between men and women is just not acceptable. He was thinking that the relationship between men and women is the relationship between a master and a servant. He is of his time. So we have to be critical with this and say, this is not the way forward. With all our scholars, we have to do the job. We, even now, we have people thinking in the light of some of the answers that they are giving in their time. So this is also very important. Now, fourth fields that we have to discuss with our own tradition is what are the sources of our thinking as Muslims? Is it only Al-Quran or Sunnah? Don't we have to take from the creation? Masadir al-Tashri' al-Islami. What are the sources of our legal framework and our understanding? Don't we have to take from sciences, from economy, from social sciences, from sociology, from political sciences? Do we have only to rely on these sciences because they are the sacred sciences and we dismiss the other sciences and everything which is coming from there? That's wrong. That's very much uh, a, a situation where, for example, the only field where the scholars came together is in medicine because the scholars, they understand that they don't know about the, the way bo the body works. So they need the physicians. They need the physicians to get the answer. So we need also to understand that uh, the creation, they are sunan kawniyya, sunnat Allah. It's Allah's tradition that we need to come back to the, the, the creation is a book. And you have to take from the book of creation to understand the world. So we also have to question our sources and to bring into... Uh, uh, uh, the discussion, all the sciences, and any one of you in this room, students who is in political sciences, human sciences, so uh, sociology and all this, you have knowledge that should be uh, uh, brought within the discussion when it comes to the orientation as Muslims to be faithful to the source. All sciences are part of this construction and everywhere once again, as human beings, we have to question what is human and what were the human contribution. So, uh, uh, it means here at the end is who are the ulama? إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاء The people who are the more uh, God-conscious uh, are the, the, the scholar. We reduce the scholar to al-fuqaha. No, the scholars are all the scholars. And the verse is connected to nature and creation, not to the book, the texts, the other book, the book of creation. So we need to understand that uh, you, for example, you live in Turkey and you live in this society. I'm very, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I, I used to say to the people, be careful. You living in Turkey, you are ulama on the ground. You know how Turkey and don't come with an answer coming from Saudi Arabia or, or, or other countries coming to your context. But you need to understand the context. You need to understand the priorities. You need to understand where you are heading. And this is coming from the human knowledge of the human environment within which Turkish people are living. So you have a responsibility of faithfulness coming from your knowledge. And no one can think on your behalf about the Turkish situation. So you know better than anyone else what is happening here. But to do this, you have to be involved in the discussion. You have to ask about the sources. You have to question. You have to try to understand which are the uh, meaning of uh, uh, uh, critical thinking or the, the conditions of critical thinking. So as I'm saying, we have to go as far as to question sciences and methodologies and then the last point that I wanted to, to add here is that we need to question authority. 
If you are serious about critical thinking, you have to go as far as this, to tackle this. Muslims today are facing a very deep crisis of authority. We don't know who is deciding, how our references are set, and we need to deal with this. We have a tradition where there is an informal authority coming from the categorization of science. We have to question this. And now we also have to question how come do you give us fatawa or you give us legal framework or who is deciding in Islamic terms. If we are not coming to discuss power, we'll end up having politicians very pragmatic, so they change their opinion depending on the context, scholars that are trying to adapt to the situation around and not coming with a crit deep critical thinking with some purposes, some uh, goals that we need to have. So not a clear uh, a discussion, a critical discussion about power. And Muslims don't like this, and especially when it comes to religions. And the Salafi literalists in Saudi Arabia, they say, uh, so the people who are in power, just follow them. That's enough. Don't ask questions. And they tell you, don't do politics, which is the, the, the, the, the, the, the most important political statement is to say, don't do politics. That's very political. But we, as Muslims today, we have to, to come with this. A human being should be critical with political power, religious power, all the powers. You have to question this. You have to ask yourself, what is this all about? And even the dominant culture. You today, as Turkish people, willing it or not, you are influenced by the West, even in the way you put the questions. And don't tell me, no, no, no, we are completely independent. Let us try to come to the serious issues here and to acknowledge this and then to be critical about this, that dominant power or dominant civilization means we have the power to put the questions we want in your mind. So how are you going to free yourself from that? By coming back with all these questions that we have. Uh, so my, do I still have five minutes? Am I still in my time? Five, 10, 15? <laughs> Bargaining time. Okay. <laughs> I, will, I will try to finish within five minutes. So now when from this theoretical framework, we come to the practical implementation or practical consequences of all this within our community. Because at the end, let me be clear about this. Very often, you know, I'm working within academia, and when you are in universities in the West, you uh, tend to, and especially in the universities where we, you know, the, the, the so-called big universities, is as if you think in an ivory tower. Oh, this is where we think, critical thinking for ourselves. Look, let us be clear. Anything which has to do with academia is to have a clear understanding of what is the meaning and the roles of universities to serve the people, to serve the society. Our thinking is to serve the people, not to be seen as the thinkers far from the society. So this is why I don't understand anyone who is a scholar who is not at the same time an activist scholar, serving, doing something out of his knowledge. You can be a public figure, but you have to be on the ground. You have to work for the people. You have to use what you are trying to theorize in a practical way. So this is what we have with Allahumma nas'aluka ilman nafi'a. God, we are asking you useful knowledge. Useful knowledge is the way I serve the people. So this university has to serve the interest of Turkish people here at the local level and at the international level. If it's a university thinking for the people without the people, you are useless. Close it. Hmm. Sometimes you have to say to some people, the way they think about university, you might have to close it. That's not the right way to think. The right way to think is a university serving and being committed. And what do we have to do here is once again, uh, from within the, com the, the, the community, is uh, how do we, from where we are starting our critical thinking, try to implement this on the ground? So. I have been talking for half uh, a quarter of a century about tajdeed and renewal, and after uh, one and a half, 150 years, we don't see things happening very clearly in, in the way. So we need also to have to think about what is called in the Islamic tradition, tahqiq al-manat, which is how do we translate uh, your principles into reality? 
So you need to know the context, you need to know the environment, you need to be connected to the environment if you want to translate this into what you were saying. It doesn't, there is no meaning to have a university where you ask questions if in our schools from the very beginning you only listen, you only uh, get it by heart. No, Islam is not to know things by heart, it's to understand what you know by heart. And this is why we have also to come back to our schools. Give space to question. In our mosques, give space to question. To understand, to, to get it right. So this is why we have to reform our educational process in the way we deal with Islamic science, in the way we deal with Islam, is you have the right and the duty to question. So this is also within our schools and in the way uh, things have to be done. And then when it comes to sciences, to be able, you can go to medical science, you can go to sociology, you can go to political science, go wherever you want, wherever you feel that you can bring something with one question, question the goals. What are the goals, the ends that you are serving with this, this science? Are you uh, for working for power? Are you working for, uh, and this science is for what? To try to get which kind of ethical goals that you are supporting. So this is where uh, we need also to be involved and to involve the community in politics, in economics, in cultures, in art. All these are important fields where the Islamic contribution today is very, very, very uh, superficial. If there is a contribution, look at arts today. You know, what is shaping the minds of the people today? Entertainment and arts and culture. Where is our take on this? What are we bringing into the discussion? Alternative Islamic songs? with some Arabic words, some Islamic reference to Allah, and that's it. This is what we are bringing to the people. This is where we are questioning imagination and arts in our society. We are not going to make it. This is amateurism. This is not the right way of putting things. We have to be very critical in that field. Is How do we now have professional uh, artists, professional thinkers, writers that are bringing something into the field? The same with economics. We have Islamic economy and the only thing is we are Islamizing the means, not the goals. We want to make the same amount of money, but with halal means. That's not the way. That's not just adapting ourselves. I even heard some scholars saying, in fact, Islam is a regulated capitalism. Is this our answer? Is this the way we are going to contribute to the world, to come with? So critical thinking for the sake of critical thinking without contribution might be a problem. Might be a problem because we will end up... Uh, so this is why I'm saying all these fields should be coming with our own cosmology, the way we look at the world, the way we look at uh, sciences and the way we look at human beings uh, and also bringing ulama and nusus, the scholars of the text, and ulama al waqa as I'm, I, I put it, and the context, this knowledge, it's very important. I would say to come to my conclusion that, in fact, contrary to what we are doing today, we need much more philosophy in our educational process. Educa philosophy means question the why. And in Islam, we have a philosophy of law. We have a philosophy of science, even when we were talking also in epistemology, it's very important. So the, the bigger picture is philosophy of law and the philosophy of life. Ulama and scholars, when they, they were reading in the Quran, Allah taught you the book and hikmah. They say hikmah is the sunnah. No, that's not true. This is a legal reading. Hikmah is wisdom. And wisdom is a concept of life and death. It's the big picture within which you put sciences, within which you put all the sciences, within, within which you put your understanding of life. Al-Kitab is for you to get wisdom. Wisdom is loving this salamat nafs Where are you wise in Islam is that when you get salamat nafs Well, salamat nafs is this inner peace, but not only. You should be at peace with creation, respecting the creation. How are you going to deal with sciences to get peace with the creation and with human beings? Because 
peace is not, it's easy to say, very difficult to achieve because there is lots of conditions. When, for example, we say in Palestine there, is, there will be no peace if there is no justice, one of the conditions of peace is justice even with yourself. Why do you have uh, uh, Adam and Hawa in the Quran saying, Allahumma zalamna anfusana, we have been unjust with ourselves, meaning we are not getting peace if we are unjust with ourselves. You will never get peace if you are unjust with the poor people, never get peace if you are unjust with the people who are oppressed. So peace is essential in our cosmology that Peace requires education, justice, freedom. All these things are essential. So we need to come with this big picture. And this is a philosophy of life. It's a philosophy of sciences. It's a philosophy of law. It's, this is metaphysics that is completely missing. We are now reducing Islam to repeat the halal and the haram. And I'm afraid sometimes the critical thinking is just coming against this not with the big picture that is needed now. And we are very reactionary in the way we are dealing with this. And I would say, and I, I would argue, please, don't bring this uh, whole critical thinking as if it was rational and not spiritual. You know, the way you deal with your own self in a spiritual way is very much about critical thinking, very much about this. In the Sufi tradition, al-muraqaba, the fact that you have self-controlling yourself has to do with critical thinking. Assess yourself. And the first that you have to assess is yourself. Your intention, the way you are dealing with yourself. Are you respecting yourself? Are you respecting your mind? Are you respecting your heart? Are you respecting your body? Self-critical approach. No spirituality without self-critical approach. So please bring it into the world, not as rational thinking against spirituality, but spirituality as the light of this critical thinking. Meaning, we are critical because we are questioning the meanings, the goals, the way. And at the end for us is critical thinking to know if we are serving God for the better or serving our interest for the worst. That's essential in our understanding because this is the whole understanding of the spiritual way uh, and I would say that critical thinking should be based on this very deep understanding of what spirituality means with ourselves. The critical thinking starts with ourselves. And for us, at the end, as much as I have to change myself, I have to change the world. And to change the world, that should be a, an added value, a contribution. One of the main crises of Islam and Muslims today, of Muslims, not of Islam, but Muslims today, is very much that we are not adding a contribution. We are trying to catch up with a dominant culture, a dominant civilization. We are very often Islamizing the means and not questioning the goals, and we have to do the opposite. This critical thinking is, start with what are the sources? How do I question what I understand and what do I want to achieve? as a, a human being, as a Muslim, knowing that at the end, all what we are doing with critical thinking in our tradition, with the scholars, within our tradition, with the world and sciences, should be something which is serving humanity. Remember something. When you start with being critical with your own self, this is the way you can give to people. And the most, the most beloved, the most loved by God is the one who is most useful for humanity. Inna ahabbakum ila Allah, minkum ila Allah, and fa'akum lin nas jami'an. Ahabbu nas ila Allah, and fa'akum lin nas. That's also something which is important. But once again, don't be obsessed with the other. Start with yourself. There is also already enough to do with our own selves. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thank you very much, Professor Ramazan, for your presentation. May I ask Professor Vice Rector Attila Arkan to present his gift to Professor Ramazan? <laughs> Professor Ramazan, I'm quite happy to let you know that there are now 40 saplings planted in Istanbul on behalf of yourself. How many? 40. Oh, good. <laughs> And it's
I just would like to remind you that the second honorable keynote speaker, Professor Mohammed Mimtazali, will have his speech at half past two at this hall.